I hope that I'm not going to disappoint you by being, uh, you know, by not being your your token non-Goddard person, because uh, as it turns out, my uh, my wife is an astrophysicist and uh, had uh, had been at Goddard for many years. She just moved to the National Science Foundation uh, last year, so uh, we're we're Goddard alumni, I suppose. But that is not at all how um, I came to the subject of uh, of my talk and the, these things that have interested me uh, for many years. Um, sort of anomalously, um, I, can't, I took interest in these, the, the two objects or sets of images that I'm going to be talking about tonight. Um, as, a, as an art collector, uh, there were things that I really wanted. Uh, and I wanted to find them and, uh, and get some for myself. And uh, they've proven quite elusive over the years. Um, but uh, last, last year when Apex Art, uh, it's a non-commercial non gallery in, in New York, and invited me to, to curate a show, they said, you can curate, you know, put, put it, whatever you want, yeah, whatever you want in a show. There's nothing more torturous, uh, you know, a parameter than whatever you want. So uh, through, I kept trying to figure out what they meant by that. What did they want me to want? And, you know... <laughs> What was it that I would, had written or talked about somewhere that they had picked up on? And they really did, refused to, to tell me or show me what, any clue of what it was that they wanted from me. So um, I, I had blogged over the years, and my, my blog is called greg.org, and I had um, blogged over the years over these, these particular uh, uh, things that we're, I'm talking about tonight. Uh, one is the satelloon that you see over here behind JD, and the other is the uh, National Geographic Society's Palomar Observatory Sky Survey. Um, and these, uh, but I had never made a connection even after, say, almost 10 years of thinking and researching, thinking about them and researching them, until I put this exhibit together. Uh, then I saw that there actually was this connection between these, a relationship between these two um, these two things, uh, not just in terms of time, they both come from the mid-1950s, um, but also in terms of their relationship to photography um, and the way that photography became uh, sort of a, a, a primary or viable medium within the fine art and contemporary art world that I had been you know, most familiar with. Um, and so... When I think of, uh, you know, when I thought of putting this show together, my first idea was, well, I'll find these things that look like art, because that was what interested me, interested me most, uh, was the, their aesthetic. Uh, and then I'll find out that artists somewhere had seen these somehow, and I will, re I will rewrite art history um, with these things at the center. But what I came to realize is that these objects and these images um, are sort of imbued with some of the same ideas. Uh, they're, they're purely scientific and space exploration ob um, artifacts, uh, and their purposes were scientific, but they're imbued with some of the same ideas that inspired and motivated uh, some of the leading artists of the whole post-war era um, around the world. And I think that there are resonances there that are just waiting for us to discover between these two um, nominally uh, separate realms. So I'll first start with the, uh, the, the, the Palomar Observatory Sky Survey. Um, this is Edwin Hubble. He is po uh, posing here next to the uh, Schmidt Telescope at Palomar uh, in, in 1949, when the, the, the Palomar Observatory, Observatory first had first light. Um, within six days of, of opening the, uh, the telescope, they decided they needed to figure out what they were going to look at. And so um, they had, you know, construction had been sort of uh, slowed during the war and stopped. Um, but they, uh, Hubble and a couple of the administrators there, decided to uh, commission a sky survey, an atlas, that they would distribute. Uh, they would use it primarily at Palomar, but also distribute it through out uh, the institutions and academic uh, institutions and observatories and libraries to, to have a common frame of reference for study. 
um, this, uh, this survey was supposed to take four years and ended up taking nine to complete. And it was overseen by an astronomer named Rudolf Minkowski, who had fled um, Nazi Germany in the 30s uh, when he'd lost his position uh, teaching in Germany and landed at, uh, in Pasadena. And he uh, was personally involved in taking 1,620 uh, plates uh, that were used, uh, I'm sorry, 1,620 pairs of plates that were used to ultimately um, make 935 pairs of plates that basically constituted the first complete portrait of the visible universe. Um, at least that portion that was visible from California uh, <laughs> with the equipment that they had. Um, and those plates then were published, they were glass plates. If, for, if we go to the next slide, Chris, uh, we might have a picture of those. Um, that, that's it. <laughs> 14 or 935 uh, pairs of plates in red and blue spectrum. Um, that were taken over the course of nine years and then published uh, and distributed and were used uh, both to reference objects but also as uh, sort of a typological uh, uh, study medium to find different types and, uh, and uh, categories of uh, celestial objects. Um, these, uh, these were really some of the most sophisticated and complicated um, photographs that have ever been made. Uh, they were all done by hand. They developed the emulsions uh, in collaboration with Kodak to, that the ultimate limit of their resolution was the emulsion itself. Um, that they needed a fine enough grain to see all of the, uh, the, these are galaxies really, this little tiny grit that you see sort of scattered across these plates. Um, uh, and the, the resolution was, I mean, the, the amount of light that they captured, they were about a million times the limits of, uh, of human vision. Um, so, you know, obviously by the time they were done, uh, they, were, they were pretty much obsolete. Uh, the technology had advanced, uh, but they were, they've been in use for, solid use for at least 30 years, and they still have, the data in them is still uh, viable for doing uh, time studies and things. If we could go to the next slide, Chris. Um, but they were, they were such that the, they could only really be re reproduced as photographs. Um, and the, uh, this, this idea of gridding and of typology and of an encyclopedic uh, documentation of something, these are all um, very similar notions to uh, the work that, or to the artworks that were being produced by a pair of photographers in Germany Bernd and Hilla Bescher, who write um, in 1957 as, as the Palomar, the sky survey was being completed, began their work in uh, documenting these sort of categories of human uh, production and construction. Um, they were, uh, they were uh, inspired by the exact same sort of pre-war um, scientific uh, approach that Rudolf Minkowski had brought to uh, had brought to to Palomar, but um, they were looking at at very different things. Chris, if we could look at the next slide, here. they were um, searching out and documenting uh, factories, cooling towers. Uh, the next slide, please, Chris. Um, uh, I think these are gas tanks. For o over forty years, um, they have been. Uh, uh, Bernd Bescher had died, I think, in 2007, but uh, they have continued to document these things that were being lost, actually, but um, they also taught, and they would sort things into these categories and find, uh, into these typologies and, find, and, and exhibit them like this in these large grids. So when I, uh, when I showed um, these Palomar Observatory uh, plates, which I, as far as I can tell had never been exhibited before, uh, I put them into a sort of Bescher style grid, which is what you saw in that panoramic shot a couple of slides back. Um, the Beschers had gone on to uh, teach and they taught several generations of conceptual photographers, um, including uh, a gentleman named Thomas Roof, who is right now, 
or has been using um, Southern Sky Survey photographs from the uh, European Space Agency uh, and printing them at massive sizes, you know, three meters tall, uh, to uh, and, and showing those as fine artworks. And he's been using data from Cassini and some other uh, current missions as well. Chris, I think we can go to the next slide. Now, this is an installation shot then with this grid here on the, on the right uh, showing a, a certain quadrant of sky. We went nuts trying to make sure that we mapped out every six degree segment and put it in the right order uh, from the file cabinet back there. We borrowed this set from Columbia University. This is the set that my uh, soon to be wife uh, introduced me to when she was in grad school from the back uh, stairway of uh, Columbia. Um, and this on the left then is the, uh, the Satelloon that you see over here. Um, and this is, this is another uh, thing that I had found quite fascinating, um, but it was uh, quite vexing as well because it seemed obvious to me that it was an object of minimalist art, uh, that this pure form, uh, which had been called even by the, the NASA historians who wrote this uh, history of Project Echo, uh, which was one of the earliest, the first missions of NASA, um, called the most beautiful object that had ever been put into space. Um, it, was, uh, it was a bit of a, you know, the su success of sorts has had a million fathers, and the loudest of, of them was William J. O'Sullivan, who was an engineer at Langley Research Center in, uh, in Southern Virginia. And he took a lot of the credit right out of the gate for the Project ECHO uh, mission uh, and for the idea, although there was much dispute about that. There was a guy named John Pierce, who was the head of Bell Labs, who also had published very similar ideas of using um, a large inflatable uh, reflective uh, uh, balloon as a, as a passive communication satellite you could bounce signals off of. Um, and But, uh, O'Sullivan had taken credit for this and had said that, in fact, he'd had this idea while he was uh, attending a V2 uh, conference. And you remember the V2 uh, was one of the earliest rockets. Um, I, in researching the show, I found um, something that I, I found, I think, fairly, it, it's new, it was new to me, certainly. I'd never seen it written anywhere else. Uh, of course, the V2 was Werner von Braun's rocket program from Germany that we, uh, we denazified and brought over and became the, uh, the foundation of our own space program uh, after World War II. And in 1955, Werner von Braun actually um, had been evangelizing for what he called the American star. And I'll read this quote. This is from a book he published with um, Time Life, the editor of Time, of Time magazine in 1955. He said, um, uh, the sole purpose of this vehicle would be to be seen, to be seen by 400 million Chinese, 200 million Russians, 400 million Indians, etc. The American star rising in the West and setting in the East. Father would show it to son and the priests would be asked to. It would be punctual and predictable like a clock. Don't you think that this would do more for the Western cause in the Asiatic mind than the Korean War, the existence of the A-bomb, or the voice of America. So he had an idea for what this satellite could accomplish. Um, I don't think that that, uh, that clearly was not, it, it didn't take <laughs> in 1955. And in fact, I, I, my own theory is that the combination of the functionality and utility of a communication satellite that Bell Labs brought uh, really made it possible to say, let's put one of these into space. But I think that the reality that a, uh, an inflatable 100-foot diameter uh, satellite that reflected the sunlight and that was visible to the naked eye by everybody on Earth uh, was a very attractive proposition for the United States after Sputnik. Um, and this model in particular, which we, I had made by a guy named Jim Walensky, who is a, uh, a meteorological balloon fabricator and works for NASA occasionally. Um, this model was, is, was a recreation of a version that o O'Sullivan used to show 
Uh, he showed it at Senate here at congressional hearings here for the approval of NASA um, and promised if NASA could be created as a peaceful civilian agency in 1958, he said, we can make one, and he brought this and set it up in the, in the Capitol. We can make one of these, we'll make it 10, 10 stories tall. And that was the appeal, and that helped, I, I think, to, to sort of push the formation of NASA um, as it's sort of constituted today. Um, but as von Braun really ex, uh, anticipated, the, uh, the impact of Project ECHO, uh, which was ultimately not really useful as a communications technology, uh, the most useful aspect of it was its, was its spectacle. Um, and that the American star, uh, I believe, helped to ease the sort of insecurity that America felt after the, uh, the launch of Sputnik and the several years of failed um, responses to it. But it also helped to cement the idea through its constant presence of an open sky uh, policy that was sort of a demilitarized zone of space that was sort of a counter to any Soviet ideas of space. But it also ultimately, I think, and where the beneficiaries are the, I don't know if that's the right word, um, it normalized the notion of living beneath satellites. Um, and it, uh, it made possible um, the use of uh, satellites to do surveillance and reconnaissance over the Soviet Union, uh, where they had been uh, very wary of doing that before, fearful that it might be considered uh, an invasion of airspace. Uh, but once satellites were up and seen for several years, it was no longer an issue, and uh, surveillance satellites were able to take off. Um, but I think um, the, the thing that I find then ultimately most interesting about these objects is that they do bring with them then this whole history of uh, politics and culture. Um, and that where the Palomar Observatory was sort of this last moment um, where the skies were empty, we were on the earth looking out uh, to the limits of our ability. Uh, but as soon as we could, we put something out there to look at and what was it? It was basically ourselves. It was a mirror uh, that turned, the sp turned space into sort of a, uh, a site of our own activity. Um, and it put our culture and all of our values and our, our uh, politics in orbit uh, around the Earth. And it was really sort of a transformation of, of space itself. Uh, Chris, maybe we just do a quick end through the last couple of slides, because I completely I got in the zone and forgot to move forward. So this is O'Sullivan here, okay. This is, how could I have forgot it? So this was a test inflation, but this was, um, they, they had made sure to have a banner ready for the, to take pictures. Um, this was a, a, a dirigible hangar in Weeksville, North Carolina, okay. And this is my favorite part of this picture is these two guys at the bottom, just looking. Um, these photographs were distributed widely throughout the, uh, throughout the, the country, uh, published frequently. Uh, go ahead. Uh, I collected some of them. Uh, these are vintage photographs. These were in the show. Um, they look like Sputnik, of course, but they are, uh, Sputnik, of course, is two feet wide. But then once you realize there are teeny little people in there, you, the scale sort of hits you. Go ahead. The last thing is that NASA encouraged people to take photographs, and as the first really visible, visible object, in, human object in space, people were taking photographs of this from the ground. And the last one, I think, is uh, just another image of that. And these, these have been very difficult to find, uh, but I've been collecting these vintage uh, prints of uh, people's photographs of Project ECHO. So anyway, that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you.